Okay, hi everyone. Um, if you're just joining us or you joined a little bit late, I'm Noelle Beebe. I work with the Alzheimer's Association. I um, was previously with Convio, um, but I've been at the Alzheimer's Association now for about a year and a half. Um, I work from home in Austin, Texas, although the association is actually up in Chicago, Illinois. Um, the association, just a little you know, shout out here, they were founded in 1980. Um, our goal is to eliminate Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Um, and one pertinent thing for you guys to know is that we have 80 chapters nationwide. So as a national organization, we're working with those 80 chapters to provide them tools um, that they can use to coach their team raiser participants. We do have about half of our chapters that are under the national umbrella or under the national 501c3, and then the other half that are their own 501c3. So you can imagine there's a lot of challenge about getting people to adopt specific ways of doing things, processes, and convincing them that our way is the best way. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. We have four different constituent event programs right now um, that are branded for the organization. The first one is our Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, the second is The Longest Day, which is our newest event series. We also have a Powder Puff Football uh, program and a Marathon and Cycling program. Those are our Blondes vs. Brunettes and All-Stars programs. I won't talk much about those two today, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on walk and the longest day. <clears throat> Our walk program is the largest event in the nation to raise awareness and funds for Alzheimer's care and support. Um, there are about 650 events nationwide, so imagine we have 80 chapters managing 650 events, and our chapters are the ones that do all of the management of those events. So again, these are... Um, these are chapters that we're providing tools for, and then they do the management of the event at the chapter level. So we have to provide a lot of general tools um, for them. So we have a lot of basics in that general uh, coaching that we do. Bless you. <laughs> um, for our walk program, we don't have a registration fee, just to kind of give you an idea of how the event works and if it's similar to your type of event. We don't have a registration fee, but we do encourage a $100 minimum um, for people to be able to earn their walk to end Alzheimer's t-shirt. Um, and one other pertinent thing is that we moved from Friends Asking Friends to Team Razor last year. Um, I was very instrumental in that, pro, in that entire process, and that was kind of the goal of my job, was to help move everything onto Team Razor, which was a very challenging year, I'm sure you understand. Um, but we did grow online uh, revenue about 15.5%, so it was definitely worth it for us. And if you know me, <laughs> you know I love Team Razor, and we'll do a lot of evangelizing here in a minute. Um, our Longest Day program is our newest event series. It's actually a do-it-yourself style virtual event. It's held on the longest day of the year, which little known fact, most of the time is June 21st, but on leap years it's on June 20th. <laughs> so for most years it's on June 21st. Um, we manage this program nationally, so we have a lot more hands-on control over our, you know, exactly what our messaging is, what we send out to participants, when we send them out. So I'm going to sprinkle in a lot of what we did for the longest day this year, just to show you, you know, when we have a little bit more control um, and when we can be a little bit more off the cuff, uh, what are the different types of coaching we do. We just completed year two um, of this event. We raised over a million dollars, so we're really excited about that. But we only had about uh, 2,000 participants, 2,100 participants, so there's a lot more one-to-one -one coaching. We actually have a, a team of coaches um, that calls out to participants um, we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one emailing. There's a lot of hand-holding that goes on with this event. So we're really involved with our fundraisers. Um, our, we do have a registration fee for this event right now. It's $35. And then we recommend that everybody raise $100 per hour of participation. So we ask that they participate, their entire team participates the 16 hours of daylight on the longest day of the year. Um, so the goal for the entire team is about $1,600. All right, this is my warning to you. <laughs> if you've ever heard me speak before, if you know me well, um, you know I'm a giant data nerd. Uh, it took me a long time to come to terms with this. I really used to hate data. I used to think Excel was like the worst thing in the world. Um, but I really came around to it because it makes my job so much easier. And I promise you it will make your job easier if you start to embrace data as well. I think all good strategies start with data. I also think report writer, and not a lot of people, not a lot of clients that can be a use report writer, but I think it's really a great tool to use, especially for Team Razor. There's a ton that you can do in report writer for Team Razor that you can't do in Reports Classic. 
Um, so if you haven't used it before, I'd recommend that you go and check it out. Um, and then I also love Excel. So once you have all of your data and you get it into Excel, I love to do pivot tables, I love to do all kinds of different stuff in Excel um, to try to identify those key metrics and those opportunities. Um, so where I'm going with this is for our walk last year, I took all of the data we had and I tried to figure out what are our best fundraisers doing? What are those behaviors that we can promote um, that we want to be able to uh, coach them to do and coach more people to do? So what our walk data told me, of course, team captains are more likely to fundraise. This we have a gut feeling about. We know our team captains are more engaged than everybody else. Um, but we saw that they raised three times as much as other fundraisers. So of course, our, our biggest goal is to try to get more teams, more team captains, um, and get people participating on teams as much as possible. Participants with an updated personal page are also more likely to fundraise. This again, pretty logical. If somebody updates their page, they're probably going to use it. Um, but it's also good to know that fundraisers that updated their page raised three times as much as fundraisers who didn't. This is kind of the surprise to me. I've always thought that online fundraisers raise more than offline fundraisers, and that is true. But the people that fundraise both online and offline raised four times more than people that raised just online or just offline. So this year we actually created a, a specific coaching email about making sure that you're asking your friends and your family in person, that you're accepting you know, offline donations, that you're having parties or, you know, whatever it is with those wraparound events, um, trying to make sure that people are, are using all channels available to them to raise money for your event. We know self-donors are more likely to go into fundraise, so if I make a donation during registration or even after registration, I'm more likely to ask other people to donate as well, and they'll raise about twice as much as people, uh, as fundraisers who do not make a self-donation. And we found out that returning walkers are, are better fundraisers as well. Um, they're more likely to go into fundraise, and they raise about $100 more than new walkers do. So we want to make sure that we're getting people coming back from year to year. Um, and excuse me, lastly, uh, we also found out that the more time that somebody is registered, the longer they're registered, the more they're going to raise. So on average, it took about a week for somebody to raise $100, a month to raise $200, and two to three months to raise $300 or more. So, those people that are in our Champions Club or they raised $500 or more, those people are generally registered for multiple months before the event. So I took this information and I turned it into our online strategy for the year. Broke it into our recruitment and our engagement pieces. So recruitment in terms of who we want to come to our events. We want people to register again. We want them to register as early as possible, to register online, and to start a team. And then once they are registered, we have that engagement piece. We want them to make a self-donation. We want them to update their fundraising page. Um, and then we want them to fundraise both online and offline. So we promote all kinds of online and offline fundraising behaviors, like sending email, using social media, and turning in their cash and check donations. So let's talk about how, what kind of tactics we use to actually put those strategies in place. And I'm going to start a little bit with recruitment, and then we'll jump over to coaching. So our recruitment email plan, I started out at the beginning of the year for WOC. So again, we launch our website in February every year for WOC, and we have those 650 events that generally take place in September or October. So I'm thinking in February about how we're going to be coaching people throughout the year. So I write our entire coaching or our entire recruitment email series back in February. So we send one email at the beginning when we launch the website. We have that live hunt or side hunt, so last year but not this year or some year, but not this year, audience um, that we're sending that email to to let everybody know the website's open and come and register. Um, and then we have about eight messages that we provide out to chapters. We, um, we create them as templates and coaching emails so that chapters can copy them and use them. Um, and we have eight messages in the four months leading up to walk. And then um, we also send some uh, national emails as well through email campaigns. Um, so just to make sure that even if a chapter never sends a recruitment email, that their people in their chapter are getting emails from us. Um, so those are generally in our May, June, July, and August time frame. So why do we use coaching emails? Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an evangelist. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm totally going to try to sell you on this. <laughs> but I respect the fact that people want to use other tools. But I love coaching emails. I always have. Um, so we're a national organization. For us, it makes a ton of sense. 
But even if you're a single organization with a single event, I promise you it will make sense for you too, and I'll tell you why. Um, so as a national organization, we use Team Razor Blueprinting. We create one blueprint and we copy, we make 650 copies of that blueprint with our wonderful team at Cambio, Eric Oiler and Taylor Shanklin and Aaron Sister, you guys are awesome. And from that blueprint, you can go in and manage the blueprint and go to the coaching emails tab and you can go and plug in all of your coaching emails there. And once you do that in the blueprint, it appears automatically for every single child event under that that event. So you can see on the left hand side here it says template. We actually create templates for all of our chapters to use. All you have to do is go in and copy it, update it, and send it out. <clears throat> so I also love it for recruitment emails. I love using coaching emails for recruitment emails because they have those automated groups of last year's participants and donors. And as Kent mentioned, <laughs> well, I schooled him a little bit yesterday. <laughs> Um, about yeah, how, to add thank those you, Noelle. <laughs> uh, how to add those additional groups from Constituent 360. So if you do want to do more segmentation to, you know, the top fundraisers from last year or last year's team captains or things like that, you can definitely do that. Um, and Ken already kind of showed this. It's under coaching emails in the delivery list area. You just keep having to click on the left-hand side. So configure delivery groups, add groups, and then you can add any group that you have in Constituent 360. One other thing that you can do is actually upload a list. So if you have, say, if you have lists in um, other areas that aren't in Convio, um, or you have your list of everybody that came to a kickoff or something like that uh, in a spreadsheet, you can actually upload that list into Convio and use that as your audience for coaching emails. Okay. One point I did want to make. Because we are creating this as a tool for our chapters, we do use conditionalization rather than segmentation. And I hope that makes sense. So what I mean is we don't create three versions of the same email because we don't want chapters to have to update and send three versions of the same email. One to team captains, one to top, you know, top fundraisers, and one to past participants. Um, we create one message and then use conditionalization to make sure that we're making those emails uh, really personal and based on the person's experience at last year's event. So we conditionalize, like I said, past team captains, past top fundraisers, past participants, and then everyone else. But when we're talking to team captains, we, we want them to know how much we value them and how much we want them to come back and start their team again. Um, to top fundraisers, we want to let them know what, what, how much of an impact they're making on our mission, um, and we want them to do it again this year. And you know telling past participants, we want you back. We know that you've walked with us before. You're not Joe Schmoll off the street. We know that you know, you're invested in our mission and we want you to come back. So making sure that you're recognizing people for their past performance um, is a nice way to, to get them involved again and keep them involved in your organization. And Noel, can you talk real quick about, oh, actually, never mind, here you go. <laughs> you didn't have this you yesterday, got, yeah. so you added it. <laughs> okay, you got me. Yeah, we had our, uh, our dry run yesterday and Kent asked me, um, so how do, you, how do you create those groups? So if you go back and you look at, on the left-hand side, we have that S45 tag, and we've actually hand-coded all of our conditionals here. And I say we, I mean Eric Euler, who is awesome, on the Blackboard side. Um, we, we actually have these groups built out of all of our past team captains from last year, all of our past top fundraisers, and all of our past walkers. Um, and how I created those groups in Constituent 360 was using Report Writer. Again, another reason I love Report Writer um, you can see on the report results tab after you run your report. And you can use filters to create, it's basically like using query, but it's easier, I promise. Um, you can, you know, find everybody that's raised over $500 or everyone that, you know, is named Sam in the state of Texas or whatever <laughs> it is that you want to do. And then once you have, have those report results, you can just click the add to group link under actions and you can create a brand new group or add them to an existing group in Constituent 360 and then set that group as an audience member for your coaching email. So this is an example of one of our recruitment emails. Um, it's pretty plain, uh, but I do want to give a shout out to Michael Chang and the design team at Blackbot who helped us design these awesome templates. Um, one quick rule I wanted to give you was make sure that you always, always, always add username and a password link to every single email. I think everybody knows that, that you can no longer reveal a password in an email, but that when, if you use the password personalization, it'll show up as a link that says, better reset my password now. Um, always, 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 especially if you're emailing past participants, it will help you immensely if you always include username and password in every email. 
And then always make sure that all of your links in that email go to the same place and they all go to help somebody register. Um, our only exception here is in that mission moment at the bottom. Um, we do want to make sure that we take time to, you know, remind people why we're here, what we do, and what services we provide. So we do have one link that goes somewhere else, but it's in a special call-out box. Everything else says register now. Um, for our longest day program, so again, with the walk, we kind of have to be general because we don't know when people are sending them or who their audience is. We expect our chapters to update those emails and make them more personal and talk about when their event day is and why it's special. For the longest day, we get to do that ourselves because, you know, we're running the entire show. So we try to create a, a nice sense of urgency for the longest day. Um, we have a specific date, you know, that's 621 that we're working towards. So we implement a, a deadline for packet mailing. Um, this year it was, I think, two weeks before the event. So on the 4th of June, we said that was the last day that you could register in order to get your packet mailed to you by event day. Um, so we made sure that all of our messaging said that. Um, and, and we had a giant peak in registration at that date. We also offer a lot of discount codes to our past team captains and past top fundraisers. Um, you can see here in the bottom, this is our, on the right-hand side, that big purple message. That was our, our first email message that went out. Um, and we have this nice big yellow call-out box that said, you went the distance last year, you raised over $1,600 for us. Here's a, a discount code that you can use when you register and you don't have to pay your registration fee. We also offer incentives and, and did some giveaways um, that also worked really well. You will be really surprised what people will do for a hoodie. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's recruitment. Let's go into coaching. Um, I want to talk about once people are registered, once you have all these awesome people that are going to help you raise money for your organization, um, what tools can you use to make sure that they're doing all the stuff you want them to do? So remember that list of things that we said we want everybody to do. Let's see how we can kind of put that into practice using Convio. The first thing I wanted to show you was our Participant Center. And Kent told me, and I almost cried, that not very many people are using Participant Center 2. Um, it's one of like the best things ever. So this is our Participant Center 2, and I will admit it's highly customized. Once again, the design team at Convio helped us to design this, and our team at Convio helped us build it. So it did take a lot of extra elbow grease that I did not do myself. Um, but I'm really, really excited about it, and I'll show you why. So that, those top five things there in the middle, once you log into your participant center for the first time, it lists out the five top things we want you to do, the steps to success. We want you to make a personal donation, update your personal page, send emails, get social, and turn in cash and check donations. Um, and with some additional Convio magic, we also made this a conditionalized checklist. So once you complete an action, you get that nice check mark on the left side that makes you feel like, yes, I did something, I completed it. And we conditionalize the messaging that says, you know, update your page, oh, you already did this, great job. So we're also recognizing them for the things that they've already done. So going back to emails a little bit, um, I wanted to call out our email template. And I have template here in quotes because it's not a stationary uh, in the traditional sense of Convio stationaries. The reason why is when you're using autoresponders and you're using coaching emails, there's so many things in those emails that are specific to the event that you can't do through a stationary. So we actually build out this template in uh, an autoresponder or in a coaching email and then copy and paste it into every single coaching email or every single autoresponder we use. Um, and the reason why is if you look um, on the left-hand side here, what our template includes, um, it has a specific link to their participant center, a link to their personal page, uh, a link to Boundless Fundraising as well. <clears throat> if you don't know Boundless Fundraising, I'm sure everybody's heard of Boundless Fundraising by now. It's a, a, a fundraiser with Facebook application. Um, some links to social sharing. Again, the username and password link. Always, always, always. Um, and then if you're on a team, your team name and progress, or if you're not on a team, your personal fundraising progress, stays to the event, and at the bottom we always have that mission message. So no matter what, no matter what a chapter puts in here, we know like we've covered our bases. Um, everything that's in there is going to help them fundraise. They're going to get to their participant center, they have their username and password, and we don't have to worry about it. So that's our basic template. Um, and I, I wanted to follow up on what Kent was talking about earlier in terms of follow-up autoresponders. We do use three of them, but we use them a little bit differently. So 
I know that the original settings, I think, are 7, 14, 28, and 42 days after. We actually changed that up. And we only use three of the follow-up autoresponders. The first one we do, uh, everyone should be fairly familiar with the autoresponders in Convia and, and Team Razor. Um, there's a forward to a friend option in there um, that goes out at the same time that somebody registers. And we didn't really like that it goes out at the same time that somebody registers. So we turned that off and we use one of our follow-up autoresponders to send it a day afterwards. So the day, like somebody registers and a day later, then they get the follow-up autoresponder um, that says forward this message to a friend. Reason being, when they register, we want them to get to log into their participant center, we want them to focus on that. A day later, they can come back and say, here's a new tool. Now that you've set up your, your fundraising page, now you can forward this email to your friends and family and have them donate to you. Um, at day seven, we send them an intro to their participant center, which includes a, a link to their video, a video that actually shows them kind of a quick walkthrough of their participant center and how to use it. Uh, another nice thing about follow-up autoresponders is you can conditionalize that based on actions they've already taken. So as you can see here, I have a conditionalization in here that says you've already set up your fundraising uh, page, you're ahead of the game. Um, now, you know, learn more about how to use fundraise with Facebook and watch our video tutorial. And our last one we send two weeks after they register, and it's how to become a champion, or those $500 plus fundraisers. Um, and this has the nice uh, everything that you should be doing. <laughs> you know, it covers self-donation, updating your page, emails, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we make sure that everybody knows everything we want them to do. So the great things about these follow-up autoresponders are, one, everybody gets them. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Even if they've opted out of email from your organization, they still get these messages. Um, whether that's a good thing or not, <laughs> um, it's a nice thing if somebody has accidentally opted out of email, they're still getting coaching from you. <clears throat> the second thing is that they go out no matter what. And what I mean by that is, again, we have chapters out there that are you know, overworked and understaffed. If they don't get a coaching email out, we know at least we've covered our bases and, and, and participants are actually getting some coaching from us no matter what. As Ken mentioned earlier, so some of the cons here, the timing is iffy. Um, your your follow-up autoresponder could go out the same day as a coaching email and they could feel like they're getting spammed. Um, there's definitely some issues with that. And there's no good performance reporting. I can't see the open rates and things like that. Um, however, you can use source codes um, if you're not familiar, um, you should check out the community. There's some good information in the community about using source codes. Um, so you can append a source code. So um, I'll go back to what our follow-up autoresponder says. This is our follow-up autoresponder, the forward to a friend. I added a source code to both of these links in this email so that every time somebody donates through this message, um, we can capture where that donation came from. And last year we raised over a million dollars using this forward to a friend message. Um, and I can track that using that source code. So there are some little tips and tricks that you can do. Tricks and tips that you can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it's a good thing to do. So whether or not you use them, it's up to you. Um, we don't use it for the longest day, but we do use it for walk, just to give you some context. So our coaching email plan, um, this is similar kind of to what Kent was showing earlier that's in the kit. Um, just kind of sitting down and saying, when do we want to send these messages? What should each message say? What's the call to action? And who's the audience? Um, we sit down at the beginning of the year and map this out for all of our walks, build them again as templates and coaching emails. And we have 11 messages that go out in the five months leading up to walk. And of course, we conditionalize those messages based on the actions that participants have taken. So you can see under that audience piece, you know, where we conditionalize and, and what we say. So once again, why use coaching emails? Kent went over this a little bit already. Um, I love, love, love coaching emails just because of the level of personalization and conditionalization that you can do. Um, this shows you right here, this is using kind of the, the WYSIWYG pop-up um, instead of the HTML pop-up that Kent was showing earlier. Um, but it shows you, you know, you can put the amount that somebody's already raised in an email. You can show them how many emails they've sent from Convio. Um, or eliminate, sorry, <clears throat> um, how much of their goal is remaining, how many days since they've registered. So, wow, you registered two weeks ago, um, you know, it's time to start fundraising, things like that. Um, one nice new thing that I learned this year as well is that in, in using that personalization menu, you can also drop in the answers that they uh, answered during registration questions. 
So if you ask things like T-shirt size or um, are you a new, you know, are you new to the organization, are you new to this event, um, you can drop in the answers to those questions in those emails as well, and that's come in handy for us. And then conditionalization too. This is really, really important. I can conditionalize based on whether or not they're a self-donor. These are things I cannot do in uh, email campaigns. This is specific to coaching emails. And I think that's really, really important to driving people to take the actions that you want them to take and, and acknowledging when they have taken those actions. So, you know, I can say if you are a self-donor, say thank you very much, next, do this next step. Um, or if they haven't self-donated yet, that's my primary thing that I want them to do. So each of our coaching emails has a single call to action. Um, similar to our recruitment emails, we always want one thing. We don't want to be schizophrenic and make them go 20 different places. We want one place for them to go and one thing for them to do. Um, as you can see down the left-hand side, these are the, the different messages that we send out. We want them to recruit other people, visit their participant center, update their page, et cetera, et cetera, until the 10 days before the event. So we elected all of our messaging last year, and we know that the best messages, the, the best response that we got were to the two messages that go out right before the walk. Reason why, as well, um, is that we also have the median days before uh, an event that people register is 11. So we know that more than half of our people are registered by 11 days before the walk, and half of the people will register between 11 days and day zero. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving those people that are registering closer to the event uh, a list of everything we want them to do. And so we send them this checklist, and it has all of the things that laid out, again, that we want them to do with a link to those actions so that they can quickly do it. If you have a little bit more flexibility, and I know we're getting tight on time here, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, but if you have a little bit more flexibility, like we did for the longest day, we had a little bit more control. So we did a little bit more spe special messaging for our team captains. We have a special template for our team captains. Um, and we foster competition using those kind of top five lists of like, here are the top five teams for the event this week, great job. You know, we can speak to them more frequently because we know they're more engaged, they want more information from us. So we spoke to our team captains um, between a week and two weeks, um, depending on where we were in the event. We also um, made it a little bit more personal and informal. We actually, since we had that team of virtual coaches, I took on the persona of a virtual coach and I wrote to them as though I was writing each individual person and said, I'm checking in with you with an update. You know, I think, you know, I want to thank you for your hard work. Um, I'm the person. I am a specific person. And I did get a lot of emails back specifically to Noelle, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, we also wanted to tailor those fundraising messages based on specific activity and metrics. So you can see we have their fundraising total, their team total, their team members in this email. If they were a team of one, which means only the team captain had registered and they hadn't recruited anybody else, we also had a conditionalization in this email that said, you're a team of one, here's a discount code that you can send to your friends and they can get $10 off registration. So it's really nice to be able to look at those metrics and how you're doing in your, your event to date um, and see what kind of behaviors you want to promote. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Um, Kent, I'll turn it back to you. I know we only have about five minutes left, so let's open it up for questions. Ken? Hey, oh, I sorry. There we go. Yeah. I, I got you. So, uh, yeah, so everybody should be listening on their phone now since I think the uh, co listen, listening through computer speakers is still not working. So, again, um, terrible, uh, so frustrating. So if you want to ask a question, please just hit star six, and you'll be able to ask your question. Noel, I do have a couple, uh, a few questions here uh, for you. One was, how quickly does your follow-up autoresponders take for your three messages? And is that kind of your strategy for all of your events? Um, how long does the follow-up autoresponders take? What does that mean? Yeah, like um, like you said, you send that one one day after you do the tell a friend or forward to a friend one day after. So you have those three follow-up messages. And mm -hmm. you, you kind of explained to me yesterday that it was kind of an onboarding type deal that was kind of a, a rapid right. uh, autoresponder. And so they were asking, what's your typical one? How many, what's the span of it? Like one day, three day, seven day, and then also is that your pretty much standard setup for all of your team raiser events? 
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we send it uh, one day after registration, seven days after registration, and 14 days. So we really okay. only go those first two weeks that somebody is registered. Um, and I, I mentioned we only do it for WAC because, like I said, we don't know if chapters are going to be sending out those coaching emails, and we want to make sure our, our bases are covered. Um, we didn't do it for the longest day, and we, I don't think we do it for other programs, um, simply because, you know, if you have more control over each event and you know when messaging is going out and you can cater those messages, um, I feel a little better about not having those follow-up autoresponders turned on. Right. Um, so this one, this question is from Annie. She, um, and you can kind of pick one of your events or one of the ones you're most involved in since you have so many team raiser events. But she was asking two questions. One is, you know, how much does your walk raise? And then how much is online? And also, do you sign up your team captains or do they register themselves? That's a great question. Okay, so last year, the 650 walks that we had, we raised uh, over $51 million. Um, we're number 12 on the Run, Walk, Ride Top 30. Um, so that was exciting. We actually moved up a spot this year. Yay. Um, then you asked, what was the second question? <laughs> uh, so how, how much of that is online versus uh, How much is online? Over? We raised about $21 million online last year. Okay, so, um, so that's about half? So you still have half raised offline? Yeah, yeah, we still have half of that's raised offline. Some of that's coming in through sponsorship, and a lot still comes in on event day. Um, our audience is a little bit older since, you know, our mission, uh, our area is Alzheimer's. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a lot of people, our, our average age is around 40, 45. Um, so we still have a lot of people that aren't so into online. Um, not, sorry, not if you're 40 or 45, you're not into online. I'm sorry, I don't mean to <laughs> discriminate. Um, but we do have a lot of older audiences that are slower to adopt new technology or trust new technology. So um, that's where we are with that. With team captains, we do promote team captains to register themselves. We have a lot of different um, chapters that do a lot of different things. So if people have trouble registering or they don't want to register online, we definitely will register them offline. Um, we will not, we'll never get rid of paper registration again because our, um, our constituency is a little bit older. Um, it's just not a possibility. Right, okay. Um, one question here from Heather was, how customized is your email? Because she liked the way it was designed and everything and the content in it. And uh, just taking a look at it, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that it's almost built like what we're delivering in the kit, kind of the same structure yeah. with the same S tags and things like that. You all just kind of use a different background and graphics to kind of go along with it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. When you showed that the picture of the kit, um, of the email in the kit, Kent, it looks really similar to what we're doing. Um, we did, like I said, we, we did have some customization in terms of the design um, and the backgrounds and things like that. Um, I'm sure those are things that you can customize within the kit. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we built those by hand. So we didn't use the kit to build out those emails. We definitely built those out ourselves. Okay, let me let me mute let me mute let me mute everything real quick and just hit star six to get every get off mute again. Yeah, somebody put this on hold. I'm trying to mute everybody's line, but it's not letting me. Um, okay. <laughs> hang on just a second. Oh my goodness. Sorry about this, guys. All right, I am trying to mute everybody. It's not it's not letting me all right, let's just uh, answer some additional questions. Okay, yeah, so, um, holly. Um, all right, so another one was, can you show exactly, uh, let's see, how effective are the milestones for increased fundraising? Say that one more time. How effective are milestones for increased fundraising? Uh, that's a tough question to answer, how, how effective they are. We, de we have two levels of milestones that we use, um, and if you don't know, milestones are where you can, uh, a participant will earn a badge on their fundraising page and will get an autoresponder when they reach specific levels of fundraising. 
and we have two milestones set up. We have one at $100 when they reach that t-shirt level, and we have one at $500 when they reach the Champions Club. Um, so at the t-shirt level, what I like to do is if you have multiple levels of milestones, is coach them on to the next level. Um, so if you reach that $100, you get an email that says, congratulations, you reached this level. Now, you know, when you reach $500, you'll get a new badge and a new email, and you'll become a champion. Um, so we like having that automated coaching um, that's in there, but as far as how effective it is, that's a hard thing to measure. Okay. Um, so Catherine, uh, your question on how do you include the participant's username and password in the coaching emails, if you would, just if you could post that in the community, I can absolutely help you out um, with that and, and show you the S tag that you can use to drop in, or just how you, if you're building it into the in the uh, Team Razor coaching email tool, um, how you can just drop that component right in using the WYSIWYG and stuff. So if you'll post that there, I can answer that question there. Um, one question here is also Teresa is asking, we haven't upgraded our participant center yet, but I was wondering since our event is already underway, would it be wise to upgrade now? I would say no. Um, I always wait. Uh, you don't want to jar your participants um, and make them feel like they're unsafe or their information is unsafe in any way. So if you're going to make a change like a participant center, I would wait until next year. Okay, perfect. And um, Emily is asking if Noelle would be willing to share her coaching communications timeline as a sample that they can use. And I think if, if I recall correctly, Noelle, pretty much that, that coaching calendar that we have is, is kind of the same flow you have, but um, maybe what we can do is if you feel comfortable sharing that, we can post that in, the, in that community thread for the webinar. Sure, and I do have to give a shout out. Um, Charity Dynamics helped us develop our timeline initially, so I do want to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm giving them full credit. We did update it this year ourselves and um, you know, wrote all our emails ourselves, but I do want to make sure that they get a little bit of credit for that. No, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Charity helped out last week, last month with our webinar and with the uh, Boundless Fundraising, so they, they have a lot of knowledge to share. Um, let's see, one other question real quick um, is, let me see if I can find this one. Oh, well, no, wait, I think that was it. Yep, I actually think that was it. Um, how much how much personal coaching is required per chapter by Asia? We'll call this one the last question. So she's asking, Asia is asking, how much personal coaching is required per chapter versus how much you handle from a national perspective? Oh, man, we do a lot of coaching for our chapters. Um, the woman that works for me is uh, Susan Sandvik. She's amazing. She does all of our um, chapter training. So we try to do um, probably four or five classes, online classes per month. Um, and those are live classes where people can come and join like this, like a webinar, um, and learn how to use different tools and, you know, where you can show them all the tools that we've provided them. We also um, create YouTube videos so that they can go back and, and watch those later. Um, we do have a lot of turnover, like everybody does, at the chapter level, so we're always onboarding new people and making sure they're getting trained. So it's definitely a full-time job to keep those chapters trained and up-to-date, and it's a, a constant struggle to make sure that's happening. Um, okay. Stuff we do ourselves, I, you know, I'm not going to lie, we do lock down a lot. We make a lot of executive decisions, quote-unquote, at the national level. Um, some that we get challenged by chapters, and we definitely listen to all of their feedback and take that into account from year to year. I made a lot of changes this year based on feedback from chapters last year, making their lives easier is my job. So, um, but we do lock down those, you know, those follow-up autoresponders, all the settings we put in the blueprint. So we do a lot from the national level, um, but our chapters definitely work their butts off making sure that, you know, the events are successful at their level as well. Okay. Does that answer and your I question? And I think uh, Madison may not be here anymore, but she had a, a question there where her hand was raised, I guess, um, in the room, but it doesn't look like she's here anymore. So I guess that should be it. She said yes, Asia says that. Yes, that answered her question. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining with us this month. Um, definitely the Texas heat, I think, is affecting some things around here with WebEx. Um, Austin is definitely hot because I know Dallas is hot and you're further south than us. Um, just want to thank everybody for coming, sticking with us. You'll be getting an email within uh, the next 24 hours with a link to this recording, to the kit, to the webinar slides, everything, uh, a link to the webinar uh, discussion in the Illuminate community and everything else. And so, uh, Noel, I want to thank you just tremendously for participating in this and providing a wealth of content and expertise 
um, you really, it really just brought it to the webinar today and added a lot of value to it. So I really appreciate that. So um, I will give you a call later on, but I thank everybody for joining us. Thanks, guys.